Welcome to the pre-dawn gloriousness of the African bushveld. I've just got a report, two male lions roaring and heading towards us. So stay tuned to Safari Live. My name is Brent, I have the incredible VM on camera and we've just got a report from our northern boundary that there are two Birmingham boys roaring and heading towards the northeastern corner of Juma. We happen to be in the northwestern corner but we're going to get onto uh, the northern boundary which is a long straight road uh, going straight east and hopefully by the time we get down to that corner those lines will have popped up on Juma. But you never know what might be between us and them. There could be leopards, there could be wild dogs, there could be more lions. So a great way to start the morning on the hunt for big male lions. Now James and Brian are out on the other vehicle. Oh, I don't know how we're going to see that. There is a very big, big elephant bull. But it is still quite dark and we don't want to put any lights on him. Now, that is a big adult bull, probably 40, yeah, 40 years old at least. It's quite difficult to tell in this low light. But he's probably close to 10 foot at the shoulder, probably 9 foot at the shoulder. A really big elephant. And as I said, we're on the hunt for male lions, but you never know what's going to pop out. Let's see if we can try and maybe possibly get a bit closer to him. Now he's right at the entrance to the northern Sabi Sands, a place called Gauri Gate. And I wonder what he's up to. He looks like he's contemplating life at the moment. He could be listening for breeding herds of females. There are some big must bulls around at the moment. And a must bull is a bull that's in a heightened hormonal state and is ready to mate. have a look and I think I recognize this bull aha uh -huh. there are some more elephants up ahead so he could be trailing a breeding herd but I think let me just get a bit closer it is who I thought it is you recognize him Liam? it's the naughty elephant Mr. Hole in the Ear. I thought I recognized him. Hello, Trouble. So, if any of you watch our Safari Live stories, this is the elephant that featured uh, not too long ago. He has a little bit of a, a mischievous streak, and he has touched the odd vehicle before. But we did have to give him a, a good stern talking to that when he tried to do it to us. And I think the last person he did it to was Scott. Now with this type of elephant, we've given him a, a good a good lesson. But we're not going to try and go any closer. And we don't want him to pick up those bad habits he's hopefully unlearned. Okay, so well, nice to catch up with an old friend. And we're going to move away from him, and maybe we'll see him a bit later on the drive when the light's a bit better. But while we head off after those lines, let's go to James, who's got the only equine we have here. Indeed, the only equid that we have here, everybody. Good morning to you. My name is James, Brian is on camera, and that is a zebra. Birchell's zebra, Equus Birchelli. It is a relatively warm 16 degrees, 61 degrees Fahrenheit if you happen to be living in the 19th century. 
and uh, it's a very pleasant morning but I don't think it's going to change uh, temperature too much because of the cloud up above us you are most welcome it's very good to have you with us today it's a uh, well it's just past sort of six o'clock in the morning and it's the perfect time to be up uh, also with us of course accompanying us on the vehicle is our special friend Mr. T the thumb dressed as a a tired thumb with a skew shirt and tie oh dear a tired thumb with a skew shirt and tie everybody he didn't sleep well possibly had a heavy night at the pub last night and left his tie on or didn't put it back on properly today uh, we're going to reverse slightly back because these zebra are walking into the clearing I thought we'd just roll back, but we can't. Um, we're as live as Brent, so please talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. Uh, unlike most of the birds out here at the moment, the last few days very silent from a bird point of view. Otherwise, you can talk to us on the email, questions at wildearth.tv, and it would be lovely to have your questions and comments, especially as we go towards the springtime. So anything you'd like to ask about the seasons here, if, especially if you're a new viewer, please feel free to do that. And I say this quite often, but if you're thinking about travelling to Africa or you've wondered about it and sometimes there's some misconceptions about Africa, I think there are often misconceptions about the size, I think there are often misconceptions about the safety. Uh, please ask us anything you like if you're thinking about coming to this wonderful and ancient landscape where humanity began. Well ask us about where we think you should go and if you have any concerns tell us and we'll allay those concerns and recommend some spots for you to go and visit because it truly is a magnificent continent there of course there's some impala just behind the zebra it's a little kinship group this I don't think it might be a little group of stallions of young stallions they like to hang around together like the thumb and his friends it is. It's a young group of stallions. So what they will attempt to do at some stage is take over a group. They will try and kidnap some females from an existing herd stallion and those females will be his daughters. So they have to go up to the father of, uh, of, a, of a filly and they have to challenge him. And if they're any good at fighting, well then they'll They'll win the fight and they'll go off, they'll sort of kidnap his fillies from him. And if they're not very good, then he will beat them up and they will sort of join another bachelor group like this until they're strong enough and big enough to challenge a father for his fillies. And interestingly, I've always found this quite endearing about Zebra, whether it's entirely true or not, I don't know. But they say that when a, a stallion is challenged by a younger buck, even if he does lose, his actual mares, the ones that he's covered and the ones that have um, been the dams to his offspring, will remain with him. I think that's quite a nice trait. Don't you, Brian? Faithfulness. Mm, and look at the subtle colours of this morning. That's beautiful. And the sky really is that colour, everybody. Sort of greyish. It's not really greyish, is it, Brian? So much as grey. Yeah. Yes. Soporific morning, and I'm going to be quiet for a second, just to give you an idea of how quiet the dawn chorus is. You get an idea. They're very little sound. A little bit from some green wood hoopers. Some very subtle whistling from some grey wax, blue wax bulls going. You may have heard the wing beats of the brown crowned chagra going. And way in the distance, one or two Franklins, and of course, Brian, in the distance, the rather strident call of. The Hardy Dar Ibis. And what did that sound like, Brian? Walk, walk. <laughs> and, and beyond that, 
the golden-tailed woodpecker gang. Yeah. All righty, on we go. Let's see what we can find. My plan this morning, and therefore your plan, is to head down towards the south and see if we can't find any tracks of Karula coming back in this way. Interesting question, Justin, especially uh, given that you're asking it with Brian and I in the car. You say, um, do animals ever suffer from insomnia? Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I really, I couldn't tell you. Uh, Brian suffers from insomnia, don't you, Brian? Oh, kind of. Yes, or sleepwalking more than some insomnia. Yes, we often find him cooking beef stroganoff at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and I didn't, I couldn't sleep last night either, and I, I, there was no reason why I shouldn't sleep except last night. So I wonder if animals ever suffer from uh, insomnia. Again, I think, Justin, it was you we were talking about, with, about yesterday, mental illness with animals, or we were talking with various people, but I think you contributed to the con conversation. Uh, again, you know, I think so much of what we do, the sort of uh, stimulation we give our brains when we go to bed with our phones and our Facebook and our Instagram and, and our TVs and that sort of thing, I think it probably con contributes substantially to our insomnia. And uh, animals, of course, don't have that. I've not seen an animal with an iPhone, have you, Brian? No, not, no, lately. not lately. We like to keep things natural in the Sabi Sands. <laughs> so I'm going to say no, probably not. Maybe the odd piece of insomnia. I imagine that a windy night, uh, environmental conditions would cause insomnia. Especially, you know, if you happen to be an impala and you thought there were lions about to eat you, well, then you might find it difficult to fall asleep. For fear that you would never wake up. This is a very grey morning indeed. Now, were a leopard to be wandering through the bushes here, we would have to see it with great skill. So while I peer into the thick bushes with great skill, let's head across to Brent and see how his lion tracking is faring. So I, I'm cheating a bit on my lion tracking this morning. I heard those lions calling probably about 10 to 5 this morning. But they happened to walk past one of the Buffelshook landowners' camps. So the Buffelshook guys jumped in the car and they are following the lions. And at the moment they're probably about a kilometre from that point on the horizon there. So they're coming from over here and they're coming towards that top point on the horizon. Oh, what's this? Oh, it's a stick. Um, and we are hoping that by the time we meander down towards there, they're going to pop out onto the Buffles Hook boundary. Or, even better, we might find the Inkahumas that they might be heading towards. Now, that female and the three cubs, her den is also in that area. And the last tracks of the rest of the pride that have been baffling us are also there in that general area. So, fingers crossed that we're going to have lions making many appearances on this sunrise safari. So far, the only tracks we've seen are hyenas, of course, a few of you thought you might have seen a lion while we were with the elephants, and it must have been the low light because there's actually an impala running across. And we're having some interesting weather at the moment with these clouds. Oh, Tina. Tina is coming out to Africa to do a field guide course. And she's asking, what should I study in advance? Tracking or rhino, oh, sorry. Tracking or rifle handling? I just need to listen to this. Not that uh, cats have uh, laying down uh, at the junction of Rock Road. So 
Oh, oh. naughty lions. <laughs> they, 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 they've, they've gone flat, probably about 400 meters from our boundary. They might get moving again. So we're going to keep looking for the Enkahumas and uh, see if we get any luck there. Now, Tina, back to your question. Now, depending on where you are, tracking for me is a very difficult one to study from a book. Uh, I've never been able to really I, I identify with the drawings of tracks. I, I've always found it, but maybe that's just the way my brain works. I've always found it much easier to see them on the ground and learn like that. Um, I would say I would just study your general knowledge information on animals. So oh, gestation periods, um, habits, and sizes, weights, because all of that stuff is going to be in the, in, in the test you're going to have to write. And rifle handling, if you have access to a rifle, is probably the thing most field guides fail. And uh, I'm pretty sure online somewhere you can see the 15 or the, 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 the ARH training. And I would recommend if you, if you do have access to a rifle, even if it's not as big as a, a, a 375 or 458, which we use out here, is uh, if you get it and all you do is you just cock load, cock, even if it's empty, just keep loading it and get that muscle memory going. Because that's the thing that people struggle with the most uh, is uh, loading at the shoulder. So keep it on your shoulder and load, reload, load, reload. And the more you do that, uh, and the longer you do that for, the better your muscle memory comes. And um, I know for a fact that, I mean, if I pick up a rifle now, I don't even have to think. It's tick, 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 tick. It's, it's, it's ingrained in me. But I would say trees is a very good one to learn. So even if it's quite difficult to learn trees from photographs, but uh, think about the most common trees. It depends on where you're going on your guiding course. But learn, definitely learn medicinal uses, historical facts, um, all that type of stuff about uh, the bush willows. If you're doing your guiding course in South Africa, uh, almost everywhere in South Africa, you're going to have uh, the bush willow family, red bush willow, russet bush willow, um, river bush willow, large fruited bush willow, variable bush willow, all of those. Learn about jackalberry scotias. And the more pre-reading you do, I would say, is the m most important on trees and the animals. And then uh, the practical knowledge you can pick up once you're out here. Hi, Shane. Shane is in, uh, on the Emerald Isle Island, the land of no snakes. And uh, Shane is saying, do lions ever come to where you live? Do you have security measures in place? Well, security measure, the most important thing. And Tina, this is something you should remember as well. The most important thing you can have in terms of safety in the bush is a good torch. Far more important than a gun. You know, VM's got one, I've got one. Everyone's got a very good torch. Now, uh, lions during the day are generally going to avoid, avoid where you live, but uh, at night, uh, they're a different animal. They're far more brazen. They're the dominant nocturnal predator. And so they will come very close to where you live, sometimes even into where you live. And uh, the most important thing is don't wander away from your ha uh, home or camp at night. That is a surefire way of becoming permanently retired and, and lion feces. And the other thing is, uh, use your torch. Now, what the torch does, it gives you 50, 60 meters if you've got a good torch to decide what to do. And remember, lions are unlikely to start attacking or charging in the, in the, in the run for the kill at that distance. They're normally going to try to get a bit closer. So you can either get to climb a tree, you can get into an area of safety. And the best form of security, uh, Shane, is vigilance. And it, and, and yeah, knowing what to do in those situations. And the most important thing is, whatever you do, day or night, don't run. You are running, you are making yourself uh, lovely. What do you see? Oh, more Ellie's. And a bit of a better light. Oh, 
take. Oh, lots of them, I think. You know, if we go forward a bit, we might get a, a view of them out in the open. I sort of check down at the water hole. There could be some already down there. Doesn't look like there are any at the water hole. They're still up here on the crest feeding. Nice herd. Difficult to say exactly how many. They're quite spread out, which is not unusual while elephants are feeding. You just see branches breaking all over the place. Almost always present forktail drongo flashing through screen. Looking for any insects that the elephants are disturbing. There he is. Boop. The great opportunists of the flycatcher world. Wherever there's a large mammal moving about, and we even get them following our cars when we're off roading in case we disturb something. Let's just try a little bit further forward again. Ooh, there are a lot in these thickets. There's an open patch coming up. Let's see if we've got a, a view through here. Oh dear, unfortunately not. They seem to be moving parallel to us through the thickets here on the crest of the hill. We can hear them all over the place. Okay, well, it seems to be an Ellie day so far. So we've arrived. It's a lion. Is that a lion, Jim? Or a leopard? You see what I'm looking at? I think it's a lion. It is, it's a lion. And a cub. Or am I imagining a cub? I thought I saw a cub. Just the lioness. Well, there we go. So far, my plan's working out quite well. So a lot of finding these animals is, is actually... So I know where the one lioness was. I know where the last tracks of the rest of the pride were. So it's sort of trying to guess, if I was a lion, where would I go? So, of course, so most of the time we actually have to follow the footprints. They're the cubs. Running. There's cubs there. Just, there we go. So there are lion cubs there, there's a lioness there. Oh, there's like a little house cat scuttling away into the bush. Now, I wonder, is this the female with the three little cubs? And has she left them at Buffalo's Hook Dam? That's quite a risky maneuver. But we're going to try to figure out what's going on. And while we do that, let's go see what James has got. Well, that's very exciting, everybody. We have actually moved since you last saw us. These are just a different group of zebra, lots of them now. Heading south, they've spent the night at Juma, obviously partying it up, and now they're heading home to Little Gauri. Alternatively, they could be sort of going south for breakfast from home. Um, I know that is completely ridiculous, but they're heading on to the south of the reserve. Now, wonderful news that we've got some lions there. Brilliant stuff, and even better news that you haven't had to drive through uh, the windy, impenetrable forest to see them. It's turning into a rather splendid morning here. 
look at them, what they're eating there. Largely the grass, but one or two of those leaves going in. Look at the copper-coloured leaves. Oh, that's lovely. Hello, Greg in Colorado. You're wondering about the birds and why it is I think they've been so silent over the last little while. I don't know, Greg. I'm, I'm quite confused by it. You know, it's it's not like it's always been cloudy like this. Um, it's not like it's it's actually been very sunny and warm. And maybe the sudden warmth has done it. A sudden change in temperatures could have been that. I'm not sure. But these mornings, I remember last year the mornings being particularly quiet at this time of the year. Let's just have one last look at these zebras. Just because their color is so pretty. Walking, there's not an ounce of green in that shot. Which of course for the wilderness is very unusual, Brian. I mean, there are birds calling. It just doesn't seem as enthusiastic as it does normally. Maybe they're just gearing up for the spring. Because come September and October, they'll be yelling their heads off. The other thing, of course, that will come out as soon as the first rains hit us, the cicada. They will emerge from the, from the ground and start yelling that incredibly loudly. Let me move forward so we can see the head of the zebra. Hello, Michael. Nice to have you with us. Please tell us where you're from next time you talk to us. You are 18 as far as I can tell. Michael, you want to know what my favourite thing about the spring is? Um, I suppose it would be the rain, you know. Just the, the simple fact of having rain in the springtime is a real joy. And then the smells that come with it. The smells of petrichor, which of course we know is that smell of the oils being released, or fungus, some say oil, some say fungus spores, being released from the earth at the first rains. We're actually rolling quite nicely here. We'll leave the engine off. Uh, Michael, and then there's the flowers, the very subtle smells of the flowers. We don't have a great number of very smelly flowers here, but we have some very subtly and very um, pleasantly scented flowers. And then, of course, the change in the colour. So it's quite difficult to say what my favourite thing about the spring is. Uh, but there are lots and lots of different beautiful things that happen during the springtime. Uh, there's always such a sense of expectation. And I think that's the world over, you know. It's an, almost an instinctual response to spring, knowing that the new life is about to emerge. <laughs> Hello, Tiffany in Oklahoma. You're wondering about tornadoes and whether our spring brings tornadoes. Tiffany, it does not. Um, I, I'm not really sure what environmental conditions cause tornadoes, but I think one of the a pre um, or one of the prerequisites for a tornado is a very flat landscape. Now we don't have a very hilly landscape, but it's also not very flat. It's gently undulating up and down all over the place. And I think you in around Oklahoma, if I'm not mistaken, have got a very flat landscape. And that apparently gives rise, along with a number of other environmental conditions, but that apparently does give rise to tornadoes. So we don't get them here, no. The worst kind of weather, or the most severe weather we can get, are big storms coming out of the Mozambican Channel. And what you would call a hurricane in the southern ocean, we call a cyclone. And the cyclones can hit Mozambique to the east of us, and then those big storms blow in here. And if we're going to flood, that's where the rain will come from. So that's the kind of most severe weather system that we would have in this area. That would just be a very severe rainstorm. And just to keep you, give you an idea, I, was, I spoke too soon. I probably jinxed Brent's sighting. Apparently those cubs have gone into some very thick bush. And so far from being out of the windy impenetrable forest, I think Brent's right back in it. Anyway, he's trying to find them. And as soon as he does, we'll go back to him. So let's just give him a bit of time to see if he can't find and settle with those cubs and their mum. I'm hoping desperately that Karula has come up or down over this road. 
This is the southern boundary of Juma. <laughs> Hello, Lindsay. You say you want to visit South Africa, but your mother is worried that it's not safe. Um, and could I recommend a safe town? Uh, well, yes, I'm sure I could. Uh, Lindsay, first of all, you need to tell me how old you are, and secondly, you need to tell me where you live because I'll be able to compare how dangerous it is where you live compared to the danger that there is here. Uh, if I were you, I'm, I'm assuming you want to come on safari and you don't just want to come to a town, uh, well you have to fly into Johannesburg but you don't need to ever leave the, the confines of the airport if you don't want to. There are parts of Johannesburg that uh, I wouldn't travel if I didn't know it well, but there are many, many parts of Johannesburg that are completely safe, just like the suburbs of New York or, um, you know, the suburbs of any other big city in the United States. And then I would recommend that if you wanted to stay in a town, you go to Cape Town perhaps, which is uh, really geared up very nicely for tourists. Um, alternatively, you could come to the bush and you could come to the Kruger National Park and you could stay very safely. <clears throat> you could either fly in or you could drive in, depending on whether you like to drive on the left-hand side of the road or the right-hand side of the road. And that would be perfectly safe for you to do. And traveling around the Kruger on your own would be perfectly safe as well. So I really don't think you should worry about that. Well spotted, Brian. Brian spotted some water buck. Good question. Thank you, Lindsay. Hello Honey's Ocelot, all the way from Nevada. You, you want to know, you say you're looking at a satellite map of Juma and you want to know where the nearest pub is. Well, uh, the nearest public convenience, I suspect you will know, well no, that's a loo, we don't want to talk about that. The nearest public uh, drinking house, shall we say, would be something called a Shabin and uh, you wouldn't find it at Juma, nor would you find it in the Sabi Sand, but you would find it in Dixie Village, which is just outside the northern Sabi Sand, and it won't be marked on Google Maps, probably because it's an illegal drinking house, and, well, probably has an arrangement with the authorities that I suspect has it falls in some sort of legal grey area, and that would be where you went if you wanted to have a sort of drink there. They sell beer by the quart, um, Coca-Cola by the two-litre, and there you might sit, listening to some beaten up speakers. Um, very good, pleasant thing to do of a, of a late evening. I haven't done it for a while, but it's quite a fun thing to do. But that's where you'd find it. It would be what we call, like I say, a shabine, which is basically a shack uh, with a serving counter and some fridges. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Oh, that is the waterbucks buttocks there, of course. I think waterbucks are the cleverest colour to be out here. See that? They disappear. So, Lindsay, if you're thinking of coming on safari, you can dress like a waterbuck and you'll become totally invisible. Then you'll be even safer. I'm being totally facetious, Lindsay. You can wear what you like. You see how beautifully it blends in? Grey and brown. Alright, Brenty has got the lioness, but I don't know that he's got the cub, so let's go and find out from him where they've gone. I'll continue my patrol down here to see if I can find tracks of the great queen. Here we go. So we try to stick with the female and the cubs, but she's gone into quite an impenetrable area. We will try again a bit later, but I thought let's go with one cat in the bag, and maybe she might head in that direction. I wonder where the rest of the pride is. So I'm quite sure that the female we saw with the cubs, or we just saw that very brief glimpse of the cubs, was the same female we spent time with on yesterday's sunset safari. And I just wonder where the other three girls and five cubs are. Let's hope she starts calling for them.
So sitting up, listening intently. Now it's not uncommon for lionesses to get split up from time to time. Sometimes it happens during a hunt. Other times this female might have gone to say hello to the female with the cubs and been separated. But they find each other relatively easy by contact calling and by scent. Hello pretty lady. Now, it's also possible that the female with the cubs might not be quite ready to introduce those cubs to the rest of the pride, and that's why she was moving quite quickly with them. There's definitely something that seems to be interesting uh, to the west. Now, Chris Rogue says she looks pink. Now, I'm not sure whether that's... Oh, no, I've got my binoculars caught here. Sorry about the noises. I just want to have a look through my binoculars. Um, so when there's a pinkish hue on the chest and face of a lion, it generally means they've been eating. Uh, I think it could just be the strange light this morning. What do you think, Vim? So the only thing I can say for sure, if we look at her bottom jaws, she's been drinking. So that little black goatee she's sporting uh, is a sign that she's ha had a drink, probably in the Buffalo's Hook water hole. We're just going to move the vehicle. There's another car about to arrive, just to make space for both of us. And also, I want to have a seat if I can check through the thicket here. And she keeps looking. I wonder if the other lions are lying not too far away. Here we go. I can't see if this is one of the lactating females yet. Or if it's amber eyes. As I said, the light is quite dull this morning. Let me have a look through my binoculars. It is amber. It is the amber-eyed lioness. So there, as we're a bit closer, you can see that. So it looks like she's got a little bit of a, a dark goatee. And it's just wet from having a drink. And looking at my monitor, I can see what Chris is saying, that she does look a bit pink. But if I look through my binoculars, I don't see it. I think it could just be the light and the way the camera is reading the light this morning. Well, there we go. Everyone's normally looking for pink elephants. We've got a pink lioness. Now she's looking towards where the female and those cubs went. She does look quite comfortable in the middle of the road. Not a bad Tuesday morning traffic jam. Oh, there you go, the eyes. Now, we did have a brief glimpse of those cubs as they disappeared, and Suzanne is wondering, how long does a lioness keep her cubs away from the other pride members? Well, it completely depends. There's no fixed and set rule, but it's generally six to eight weeks. I have sometimes as long as 10 weeks. So, but eight weeks is uh, probably the best, uh, the most general age that she'll introduce them to, to the pride, but sometimes it can be 10, 11 weeks, and sometimes as young as six weeks. Now, quite interestingly, there's a bit of research being done at the moment about lionesses sort of sinking their, their, their estrus cycles. So when they give birth, they all give birth around a similar time. 
and this helps in a social predator like lions because they are able to allo groom allo allo suckle sorry not allo groom lions do do allo grooming but allo suckling far more important so we've seen this now with the encormas oh she's watching the geese <laughs> so at the moment now there are going to be three lionesses with cubs ranging from about eight nine weeks to about 14 15 weeks so and the lionesses will generally lactate till about six months so there's three lionesses who are going to be able to suckle those cubs uh, for the next six months or seven months or so but as they get older little lions and, and as this is as they wean I mean, even at this young age, well, at eight weeks or whatnot, they're already starting to eat meat. I wonder if, are there more lions behind her, Liam? Can you see from where you are? As she's looking down the road, no sign. Now, are you going to get up and go find the rest of the pride, or are you going to have a schnooze, miss? Oh, there was one fly buzzing around her nose. So, both Dave and Silverback are wondering, what is the weight difference between a, an adult lioness and an adult male lion? Now, Amber's a pretty big lioness. I'd say she's probably about 120 kilograms, so 250 odd pounds. And uh, really big lioness can get up to about 150 kilos, so just over 300 pounds. Uh, but a big male can get to about the biggest. Well, the biggest male ever recorded is over 600 pounds, 300 kilos. But on average, uh, in this part of the world, you're looking at about between 200 and 220 kilograms. Uh, for a male lion. Oh, here comes a yawn. And so that's about 450 pounds or so. Uh, the Birmingham boys are actually not the biggest male lions around. They're probably, I'd say, under 200 kilograms, probably 190 odd. And, but with a lot of cases, it's not always the biggest individual that's the, uh, the, the most dominant. It's the most aggressive individual. So the Birminghams, what they make, a lack in size, they make up for with attitude. Um, so, sorry guys, so this little drainage line here, she went straight in there, we try to get around, but it's, it gets to the top there, there's about four little drainage lines. I'll try again a bit, bit later, see if we can find a spot to get in. I think it is, with the three cubs. So I'm not sure where the other, other three lionesses are with the five cubs. I'm pretty sure they're somewhere in this area. Yeah, they're about, about 14, 14 weeks old now. Cheers, enjoy. So this is the line we spotted first this morning. Iretis is wondering, do lioness have favorite members of the pride that they're less likely... Oh, here comes Yawn. There we go, contact calling. Iretis, I'll get to your question now. So that low little call is looking for other members of the pride. Oh. <laughs> almost a sigh. Oh, come on, guys. It's, it's almost that, that, that what you get when you're trying to phone someone who never answers their cell phone. Like, phew, come on, answer your phone. But so, sorry, Aretz. Um, Aretz is asking, do you, members of the pride have favorite members that they're less likely to spend more time away from I wouldn't say so I'd say a, a lion pride is a very close to, okay. oh, 
every time I start to answer your question, she starts contact calling again. But a, a lion, a lion pride, a female lion pride, even mm-hmm. a man. Even a male coalition is a very tightly formed bond. And I'd say they're equally excited to see all members of the pride. Now, the genetic strength of a lion pride rests with the females. So, lioness will generally take a bit more care in raising female cubs, which is the opposite to a leopard, where the genetic strength even for the females, lies within the male. So that is why female leopard take more time to raise male cubs. It'll spread their genetic line further and wider, whereas with lions, the genetic strength lies with the pride as the males chop and change about every four or five years. Oh yeah, sorry, I just need to be on the radio. Ah, uh, copy, Orbi. I'm sure that's the Mafazi we saw. She was going quite quickly up that drainage. Um, we've still got one, one Sati here on at Bovelzok Dam, and those two Madoda, I think, were left unattended at North Rock Road Junction with Gauri Buffalo Katlan. getting a bit stronger. Now, oh, Tasha's wondering, will it? Oh, you won't come in. Will the amber-eyed lioness be able to suckle the cubs if she's pregnant? Yes, Tasha. If she if she gives birth and there are still cubs around, she will be able to suckle them. Now, is she going to get on the move? Hopefully. I've got some slightly bad news. Is that female with the three cubs has crossed into Buffle's hook. Or we just saw her tracks now. Now let's hope the rest of the pride are not in Buffalo's Hook. I haven't checked the tracks further to the east, so I'm not sure. Now, she's not starving, but she could definitely eat. Some lovely, get ready for some lovely screenshots. Beautiful early morning lights about to creep through the cloud and illuminate uh, one of our favorite lionesses. So, if you do get any good screenshots, share them with us. And you can do that uh, by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or pop them on our Facebook page, Safari Live. There she goes into past the rising sun. She spotted those elephants we had earlier. Mm. 
So she's looking directly. We can just make out the elephants in the distance. That's what she's watching. Probably just picked up the movement and she's decided, no, nah, elephants, that's a bit risky by myself. Still contact calling. Hopefully it calls those males across towards us. Are you going to go for another drink? Oh, you're on the move. I think she's smelling where the lioness and the cubs was. Let's hope she doesn't decide to follow their scent outside of our traverse area. You're hearing that clickety click. It's just me taking a few shots. Now, at the moment, she's not roaring fully. She's just contact calling. But Mercedes in California is wondering, is the roar of a lioness different to that of a male? Uh, it is. It's just not as deep and not as loud. Okay, well, I'm just going to have to shoot around. Oh, <laughs> you're going to take a rest. Okay, we'll get a bit closer. Found herself a nice little vantage point. these contract calls turn into a full roar. Mercedes, then you'll be able to hear the roar of the lioness. Yeah, the blacksmith lapwings are not impressed with her presence. Looks like she heard something there, her ears picked up. Shh, plovers, I'm trying to listen. Or lapwings, used to be called plovers. Thank you. if I can hear any responses to her contact calls right, with the lapwings making as much noise as they are that is quite difficult of course with her 
infinitely better hearing than mine. She will be able to hear responses, even with the lap wings chinking away. So we're going to sit chat, see what plays out with the amber eyed lioness while we do that. Let's go see what James is. Oh, another lioness. So someone heard those contact calls. Hello. I wonder if this is the female who stashed the cubs and now come back. You're not even going to go say hello, Amber. Or are you going to ambush and jump? Oh, here we go. Watch this. Watch this. This is spectacular. Ooh. Interesting. Oh, it's the cubs. The cubs are back. We can't just see them. So this lioness might be a little bit more protective than usual. I don't think these cubs have been introduced yet. If there's three of them. <gasps> I love fluffies. Oh, isn't this too precious? Now, this, as far as we know, is the first introduction of the new cubs to any other pride member. And oh, they're still they're nervous around another line, and that's not uncommon. They, as you can see, they're very used to us, but they're not used to other lions. They only know mom and each other. Mom's going to stick with them. Aubrey, Aubrey. Aubrey, that one side to you, the three month pin pan has brought them back to Ophelzook Dam. So we've got two one side and three month pin pan. So it's the cubs that are nervous of another lioness and that's why they've moved off and caused mom to move off as well. This might be their first ever sighting of another member of the Inkahuma pride. See, the cubs don't want to be around Amber. You can see that looking a bit more confident the further they get from her. Now, it's going to be interesting to see if she calls them back and comes back towards the other lioness, or Amber Eyes, who is sitting above us. Look at that. Looking down on us. It's not often we get looked down upon by a lion. Liam, how are you feeling? A bit nervous? Okay. No, okay, good. It is quite spectacular. Standing by. Firm, just to come very, very slowly. I think this is uh, the first introduction of these three cubs to another lioness, so the cubs are a lot more skittish than they normally are. So we're not going to move, we don't want to add any extra drama. Here come the cubs running back, Firm. And it's just too special. It looks like 
one made a false step into the mud of the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. So it's going to be a gradual process introducing cubs to the pride. It's a, and it's the cubs who are not relaxed. And we immediately saw old Amber snarl a little bit, but that's because of the, the very dominant and defensive pose mom put on in front of her. <laughs> so there's the, the, the cub that took one step too far into Buffalo's hook, the one in the middle. Oh, she's, she's going to try bring them back towards Amber. This is incredible. This is not behavior you get to see very often. And normally introductions are done when there's a kill. So a nice stable sighting. Okay, I'm gonna move around. going on. We're still going to keep our distance a little bit. Okay, there we go. So, there's Amber. Here comes the mom. I can't see the cubs just yet. Mom might call them closer. Yeah, now they're right there. That's the closest they've been to Amber Eyes so far. Look, one, one is checking out Amber Eyes. There we go. That must be a little boy. Oh, this could be very, very interesting. What's going to happen? Seems to be standing right next to you having a little sniff. I'm not quite sure. Like, all well, this looks like my mom. It doesn't smell like my mom. But she's not trying to eat me yet. <laughs> Look at those rotund little bellies full of milk. I'm going to go back to mom. Mom, mom I know mom. Isn't this amazing? We're getting to see this incredible insight into the private lives of lions. Now, not many people get to see this type of behavior, and I'm so happy that everyone out on the Sunrise Safari has been able to join us for this. Now, we can't definitely say it's the first time those cubs have met. Oh, here we go. Coming out again. I've met Amber. But it definitely looks like it, just from the behavior. If it's not the first, it's the second. saying just yesterday that it's got to be in the next week or so that the cubs are going to be introduced to the rest of the Nkuma pride. I know it's not the full pride yet, but that's definitely a start. wondering, has a female ever not introduced her cubs to the pride before? Um, it's unusual. I haven't heard of anything. 
but there's there's cases of nomadic females who do breed but they don't hold a pride but uh, that's because they just they don't have a pride and it's very unusual for those cubs to ever survive well look there's little muddy paws see they're getting getting a little bit braver with amber she's being quite nice and calm Just to come to the right of me and go a little bit further forward, you should have a very nice view there. Go back to mom, but they should come back out again. And we're just going to sit patiently here. As I said, this looks like the first introduction of the cubs to uh, another member of the pride, so they're not too relaxed yet. So you'll probably find they'll do a lot of these little forays from mom back closer and closer to the amber-eyed lioness. Now it leaves the question, where are the rest of the Nkumas? Just playing. I think they drank earlier because the one cub's got mud all the way up its legs, so I think it took one step too deep into the mud. So yeah, that looks like the little boy, the little male cub, and he's just a little bit more brave than the two ladies. Comment from Sham Sung says an insight into the private life of lions, such a privilege. Indeed it is, and it is incredible we're able to follow the lives of all these animals here on Juma on a daily basis. All right. Amber's happy that someone answered her contact calls, she's going to have a snooze. Oh, here we go. So you're getting more brave and more brave. Realizing, oh, 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 oh. It's going to be interesting to see how Amber Eyes reacts. And she's very tolerant of the other cubs, so I presume she'd be just as tolerant of these. But as you can see, it's going to take them a while before they're as comfortable and confident with her as the other little five cubs are. says with this sighting these little cubs have broken the cute o meter well we've always said little lion cubs are definitely the cutest in the bush cuter than leopards cuter than baby hyenas Okay, 
mom's playing quite a lot with the cubs. They are hidden by a little thicket. So we're going to wait for them to pop out again. And while we do that, let's go see what James has got. We've got a little owlet, everybody. It's a pearl-spotted owl. I think you can see that from the fact that it's got those eyes in the back of its head. See that? Brian, can you brighten that at all? I think that's an eye I can see in the back of the head there. Yes, it is. Look at it wagging its tails because it's happy to see us, Brian. You see that? There we go. Isn't that sweet? There you can see the eyes in the back of its head. How cool is that, everyone? There he's turned around. Still wagging his tail. Now, I tried to talk to him, but he would... Oh, he's gone. Now, what happened was that there were two red-breasted swallows going... There they go. Isn't that cool? Are they mosk swallows or are they red-breasted, Brian? <laughs> Let me look. They're red-breasted. Isn't that a lovely call? I don't know if you heard it. Hear that? How cool is that? And they're only in the air because that owl went to sit in the tree that they were resting on in the light of the early morning sun. It's turned into a rather beautiful morning. There's some blue sky behind and some heavy grey cloud to the south which gives it a lovely ominous feel. Look at them fly. The processes that are going on in that bird's brain for them to be able to fly like that, the protection of the brain for the g-force that they pull the g-force they pull is far greater than any g-force that a fighter pilot might pull in a supersonic fighter jet. They change direction much faster. Ah, it's so cool. Isn't that wonderful, everyone? Brilliant camera work from old Brian, despite the fact that his thumb is so disheveled this morning. And that really is quite astonishing, I must tell you. <laughs> and we, of course, are now awaiting the return of the barn swallows. They will have left Britain and Europe by now. How cool is that? They don't want to land. No. I just want to quickly see... I don't know what they're eating at this time of the year. Let me just quickly look it up while you watch them. Brilliant that we've had those lions. Just fantastic. Right, red breasted swallow. And if you can hear, just listen carefully. And there. There was an, another pearl spotted owl calling a long, long way away. It is just aerial insects that they eat, everyone, so they will have to find insects to eat. I didn't think there were any, you know, until Brian pointed out the other night as we pulled into the workshop where we parked the cars. The neon light there and its cover is now filled with insects. And that's been since the winter began. So there obviously are aerial insects flying around, almost imperceptible, almost invisible. There we are the red-breasted swallow hunting for aerial insects because they were disturbed by the pearl-spotted owl. I'm going to sit here watching these things for a little bit longer. The lion cubs have re-emerged out of the bushes, so let's go and have a look at them. So 
they've popped out again. And it's still not going that close to the amber eyed lioness. like the little boy again surveying his his domain now tatty's wondering does a lioness seeing another member of the pride's cubs have a biological or hormonal effect on them? Well, Tatty, probably not. Um, uh, most of the... Oh, there we go. Wait, just hang on, Tatty. We'll get back to your question now. Mom's moving out towards where the amber-eyed lioness is. Now, remember that initial aggression we saw has now seems to have gone. And this is Mom now encouraging the cubs to come even closer. And the other two are wrestling away in the thicket but they should come out shortly. Tired kitty. Isn't that just absolutely gorgeous? Back to back in Kuma lionesses. And all the amber eyes is watching the elephants move through the bush. Angel's wondering, how old will these cubs be before they start eating meat? Um, if meat is available to them, they will eat it at as young as six weeks. These guys are probably eight, nine weeks old now, so they would definitely eat meat if they were taken to a carcass. Cubs are playing in the thicket, so we'll wait for them to come out again. And we're just seeing what's happening. Well, Nancy would like to keep them at this size forever, they're so adorable. Now that they are, Nancy, but for the future of the pride, the more of the female cubs that make it to adulthood, the better. Well, there we go. About to pop out into the open again. All but tackled beforehand. All three out now.
might use mom as a springboard to climb onto auntie. Cub touching faces with amber eyes. All three out again. So from this age onwards, they're going to get a lot more boisterous, a lot more playful, especially after they're introduced to their other five little cubs of the Nkuma pride. I think we're going to be spoilt for the next little while when it comes to cub viewing. Not to say we haven't been spoilt already. Sometimes it's just wonderful to sit quietly and watch the shenanigans. Oh, uh, I thought for a second one of them had got hold of Amber's tail, but it's Mom's tail. Probably not quite brave enough just yet for the auntie's tail, but Mom's tail is a favorite toy. seems to be ignoring quite well. Oh, it's seen Amber's tail, it's moving. Is this, could this be the cub's first faux pas? They've just spotted the elephants. <laughs> uh, the little cubs, oh, they've just spotted the elephants on the other side of the dam. I don't think the elephants are going to hold their attention for too long, not with tails around. for a better lion sighting than this. Tasha, there we go. Tasha's wondering whether the amber-eyed lioness would be rough with them because it's the first time meeting them. Uh, Tasha, you never know. And sometimes lionesses can be quite aggressive the first time meeting cubs, specifically if the cubs 
and bite their tails or do anything like that, but so far Amber seems to have been the doting aunt. Perfect light and perfect little cubs. Oh, don't look at Amber's tail, that might get you into trouble. Uh oh, oh, tail. Oh, not quite brave enough with Amber yet to attack her tail. Well, attack a sibling instead. Michael. Michael's 18 years old and Michael would like to know. So, well, he says it seems that female cubs are slightly more timid than the males. And is there a reason for that? An ecological reason? Uh, yes, Michael. I mean, males need to be, have that sort of uh, bolder, more aggressive stance because they have to leave the pride at about three years old and go set up for themselves. So, That'll be the reason that males are generally a little bit more bold. Oh, complaining. Isn't this just picture perfect? So I said we can't be 100% sure that this is the first introduction of the cubs to another lioness, but for me, it, it just from the behavior wise, it does look like that. Uh, every now and then you'll notice the lions look over to our right, and there's a herd of elephants feeding through there. Not the, you can just see some bottoms. Here we go. There's an elephant bottom. But while we sit here and continue to observe what we think is the first introduction of the Inkahuma, Inkahuma's latest cubs to the Amber Iron Lioness, let's go see how James is doing. So oh, wild. Hello everybody, we've come to Arethusa, having driven the length and breadth of Juma this morning and come up with, a, we had a hornbill sighting, didn't we Brian? It was a very nice hornbill sighting. We had uh, some um, diker, cabra steer and um, but unfortunately that's about it. Now there's an update, we're lurking around here because Tingana apparently is on Simbambili, maybe heading this way. Uh, how they can tell whether he's maybe heading this way or not, I'm not sure. Ooh, there's a very large pig, huge pig, Brian. Massive, massive pig, see it? Huge, full frame pig. I couldn't. That's a massive pig, everybody. You know they could weigh up to 100 kilograms, it's 220 pounds. I'm not sure if this chap is pushing quite that mass, but he's big. He's a solid fellow. Tungana should come here. We also got an update on the Styx Pride, everyone. Let me just go backwards. This chap seems to be relatively confiding. Um, the Styx Pride, all of them went south into Mala Mala from Cheetah Plains. So they're obviously were picked up, those cubs, which is nice. Mum and the mums came to fetch them. 
And what an amazing sighting of those little cubs that you've just been having with the pride. Big boar. And you, I think he's doing fine. They're looking a little bit skinny. That's not unusual for this time of year, though, for a warthog. But I don't think he's in dire straits at all. Onto his knees there to say his morning prayers and perhaps have his breakfast at the same time. I'm just looking at him now with the binoculars to see what state his body condition is. He's looking a little bit hippy and ribby around the back, but I, like I said, on the way to Hoodsprate, outside some of the reserves that are not open systems like this, yeah, the warthogs are really struggling. But the chaps here seem to be just fine. <laughs> he's watching us. See how he stopped for a little while? He's trying to assess what we want. How on earth him eating here can be fascinating. Sorry, Kirsty, as you spoke, the game drive radio began. Can you go again with that one? Hello, Pierre, in Australia. Um, you, you want to know if I know any scientific names that are, are better than the common names? Well, it, I suppose it depends very much on what you, sort of sound you like. Um, I think that thing, if I'm not mistaken, is called Phacocerus aethiops, aethiopicus. Is that right? Phacotherus aethiopicus, something like that. That's not a particularly wonderful name. Um, no, I can't think of a mammal that has a Latin name that I prefer to the common name, many, many trees. Zizifus mucronata being the obvious one. Uh, buffalo thorn is its common name. But Zizifus mucronata, its Latin name, which I think is a wonderful name. Also the common spike thorn, uh, Gymnosporia buxifolia. I always think that's a good name. Gymnosporia buxifolia. We're going to head down towards the Arethusa Dam and see what's going on there. Perhaps there will be something there. Perhaps there won't. Much luck has been with Brent Leo Smith and you chaps this morning, and that's brilliant to have those little cubs introduced to Amber Eyes. And I'm fascinated to know whether Amber Eyes has actually mated now or not. I'm um, just, um, apparently there's some impala alarm calling around here. Just going to get an update from them. Just listening carefully. I can't hear an impala alarm calling. Yes, yeah, it's all very silent. A bit of wind blowing. But otherwise, not much. Let's just move a little bit forward, have a look on the road. I think there were some tracks, perhaps. This is kind of why we came into this area. We were hoping maybe Shadow would pop out here. Hello, Dark Tranquility. <laughs> Dark Tranquility, hello to you, and what a lovely name you have on Twitter. Again, probably not the name your mother gave you. You want to know about interspecies relationships, and do I know of any that happen here where two species are good friends with each other? Um, well, I suppose the obvious example would be oxpeckers and many of the species that occur around here. Um, <coughs> from buffalo to kudu, excuse me, to... Uh, to rhino and that sort of thing. Uh, just hold on one second. Go ahead. No, I didn't, and I stopped as soon as I heard you call it in.
So he's just telling me about um, Impala alarm calling. Copy. We'll have a. We'll keep it our eyes open. Um, so dark tranquility. A good uh, a good example would also be. Um, uh, Sometimes jackals and wild dogs get together, and I've told the stories of... Sorry, I'm just listening to the radio. Um, what happens is... What happens is that they... Um, that the jackals and wild dogs will sometimes hook up in a, in, in a little sort of pack. And there was a wonderful story of at Mombo in Botswana of a single wild dog who didn't have a pack and so she hooked up with a, a couple of jackals. She used to feed the pups, look after them, and then a hyena joined them. And the hyena, while not really part of the pack, used to kind of scavenge off them a little bit, but wasn't in any way aggressive to them. So that was quite an interesting one. It really is very unusual though. But then I suppose you do see it with... Um, you do see it also with things like uh, wildebeest bulls, which will move around with impala herds for safety and that sort of thing. Right, dark tranquility, that's enough from me. Brent has got the lions still and something else with them. So the lions are on the move and due to a larger member of the African bush arriving, they got a whiff of the lions and gave a good trumpet. Just gonna see what's happening. Let's get a bit closer. So Amber's gone up there. As you can see, that trumpet. Oh! Sidetracked by an elephant dung ball that rolled. Now the elephant herd is the half trunk herd, so actually a herd we had last night. Okay, I'm gonna get into a position. I think they might chase the lions. So let's just get into a position where we're gonna be able to see both. Now the cubs are quite oblivious playing with elephant dung. The elephants have stopped. There are the Ellies. Oh, now the cubs are running after Mum. Now Amber's just up ahead. Now I have seen lion cubs of this age show some tremendous speed when being charged by elephants. This is absolutely, absolutely magical. Um, we've got two of Africa's big five in the same place. We might get to see some interspecies interaction. Now, even though these lions pose almost zero threat to the elephants, the elephants just really don't like predators. But it seems like now that the lions have got up or downwind, sorry, of the Ellies, there's half trunk. But we're going to stick with the lions. Now, Amber's headed straight up the road where we first found her. And I'm wondering, could we possibly be lucky enough to see the first introduction of these cubs to their cousins. Are you still with the part of lunch?
I love the way little lion cubs jog after mom trying to keep up. <laughs> Okay, if I approach from, uh... And uh, they, you can see they're not quite the most coordinated yet because there's often a little stumble or trip. You can hear squirrels alarming at the lions. Just make out Amber Lioness. She was right up ahead of them there. Could we be in for the biggest treat ever, seeing these lions meet up with the rest of the pride? And particularly what I'm really looking forward to seeing is them, the meeting of the cubs. So meeting their cousins. So it could be quite a rambunctious affair. Now, Chris Rogue's wondering, would the lionesses cause a diversion for the cubs to hide? I have seen a lioness sort of charge at an elephant with cubs, giving the cubs a chance, but normally the cubs instinctively get out of dodge uh, in enough time. Okay, so here go the lions in there. I'm going to just jump up ahead of them, because if they are going to meet the rest of the pride, we want to be on the other side as they walk in. So we're going to leave the, the female with the three cubs now and we're going to shoot up. I just saw Amber disappear into the bush up ahead. There she is. So fortunately for us they're actually moving parallel to the road at the moment which makes our life a little bit easier. She is going to duck off into the bush shortly so I'm going to go off-road from up here. I'm just really sort of scanning, hoping to see the rest of the pride. Hold on, Vim. Yeah, so while we get into position, uh, let's go and see how James is doing. Hello everybody, we've just got a very, very beautiful little herd of Nyala coming straight past us. In the background, a fish eagle is calling. Isn't this awesome? They're not vaguely upset by us. I think this is so cool. Two young males, uh, three cows, one very small calf, slash lamb, depending on what you want to call them in the Nyala case, and just completely relaxed. This <laughs> is wonderful. Simon, I'm slightly astounded by this question. You say you were in Addo last week and you saw a kudu trying to mate with a nyala. Have there ever been a hybrid between the two? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. I didn't think it was possible. I mean, they are from the same genus, so I suppose it could be possible. That is really astounding. I've never even heard of it happening. But I don't suppose it's impossible, obviously. Um, you know, it it is possible that even lions and leopards might mate with each other in the wild if they were found with each other in the wild because I guess they're so closely related that the hormones related to estrus and that sort of thing uh, might be common. But um, I would say that's extremely, extremely unusual. Gee whiz, that's fascinating. I don't think that a hybrid would result, because I've never heard of a kudu and a nyala hybrid. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think it's highly unusual. All right, we're back with the lionesses. Apparently, uh, transport issues going on there.
So mom's actually busy trying to pick up one of the cubs at the moment who does not want to be picked up to carry. Now, normally they carried when they're a bit younger. Oh, oh, so much complaining. So Amber's probably about, I just keep getting glimpses of her uh, behind us. Whoops. They're coming right up to us. You can see the little cubs have got so used to us. They're right next to us. They're probably going to pass within two feet. Hey, little monsters, jogging after mom. You can see how close they are to us. Isn't this absolutely amazing? Wow. Okay, we're gonna have to do some Maneuvering through the thickets again. So Amber went basically there. Oh, I can't see my monitor. There the line. She went off in that general direction. I'm really hoping we're going back to the rest of the pride. That have been avoiding me for the last couple of days. Okay. So while we maneuver through the bush, let's go see uh, what Commander Bond is up to. We've arrived at the Aratuza. I hesitate to use the term dam because there is no water here anymore, but there is quite a swathe of animal and bird life. So let's have a quick look. There's a fish eagle flying away onto the top of the dam wall, a juvenile fish eagle. And that juvenile fish eagle has unquestionably been eating, Brian? Uh, You're a fish, yes, correct, fish. That's what fish eagles eat. And there are lots of dead catfish, I assume, lying in the mud here. And I'm sure that's what that fish eagle was eating. Now, if we pan, oh, there are lots, there's a mixed flock of, I suspect, widers. Oh, look in front of us there, Brian, on the ground. There are a whole lot of little birds. They are all canaries, actually, everyone. Yellow-fronted canaries. Sorry, they're the little things just sort of scrabbling about in the, on the ground in front of us. I think if you go, if you go left a bit, you'll see them, or right a bit, so there they are. Those are all canaries, everyone. And they'll be picking up bits and pieces of termite, probably, and the odd grass seed, if they can find it. There are a couple of also grey-headed sparrows, but I don't think you're going to pick them up in this light. And then, beyond the yellow-fronted canaries, we've got a massive herd of Nyala all over the place there. There's a bull, and to the right of him, some cows, another bull behind, and they're all enjoying the sort of last bits of green that are growing as a result, probably of a, could well be a leaking pipe or something like that, that's leaving that as greenery there, very popular. There's some impala there as well. And I think the hippopotamus from this area has finally absconded and gone to find something else.
Hello Cheryl, you're getting hold of us all the way from Oregon and you say with all the lambs and calves that are going to be born in the springtime or certainly in the summer, uh, will the lack of grass mean that the lions and other predators have an easier time of it? Well, yes and no. Um, I think you'll find that we, well, we expect there to be some rain, so we expect there to be much more grass than there is now. Um, if there isn't any grass, I think you'll find, yes, while it might be easier for the lions and leopards and that sort of thing to catch these little ones, the little ones are not going to survive long. And indeed, many of the mothers uh, could easily uh, abort their fetuses before they even give birth because, you know, they, they are so nutritionally compromised themselves. So, in principle, yes, I suppose it's possible that it could be easier for the lions uh, and leopards and wild dogs and cheetahs and hyenas and jackals and other things that like to eat little babies. But it's not necessarily so that the, all those babies would be born. So there you can see a lovely mixed herd of impalas. I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier about the fact that, or about species that sort of form friendships, interspecies friendships or aggregations. This is a bit of an example of one here. Those Nyala and Impala, while they're certainly sharing the fact that they've got the last bits of green here, they're also using each other for security. Because as the water becomes more concentrated and the food becomes more concentrated, the predators actually figure that out. And that means that they will come into an area like this and sort of lurk on the fringes, hoping to catch some unsuspecting antelope or warthog. I was rather hoping Shadow might be doing that. She's been very shadowy of late, hasn't she, Brian? So shadowy. Alrighty, the lions are still around with Brent. Let's go back to them and see what's happening there. Goodbye, Mr. Fish Eagle. So there was some very interesting behavior that happened. So mom started running quite quickly. Like she was excited by something. And then we caught up with Amber. There's the rest of the pride and the cubs. The whole pride's coming in. So this is going to be the first introduction to the cubs and their, their cousins. I just got a glimpse of them through the bush. This is really exciting. The whole pride, the whole Inkahuma pride. So this is the first time these little cubs are going to be introduced. It is quite thick here. Yeah? So, Vim, what do you reckon? We're going to try to see where the best view is going to be. I think we're probably in one of the best spots. I'm just going to reverse a little bit. How's that, Vim? So, don't be alarmed if there's a bit of snarling and growling from, from, from the, the mother and from some of the other adults. It is always an exciting and trying time. But I saw the other five cubs careering towards this position. They seem to have stopped down in the little river system. Okay, we're going to have to rethink our strategy now. Okay. Okay, hold on. So the rest of the pride are just off to my right here and it looks like she's going back to that den site where we had her yesterday in quite a precarious position. Okay, I can see lions everywhere now. There's just lions all over the place. Okay, we're going to be there for the first, first encounter. Here come the cubs running into the other cubs. Vivian, this is the first encounter. They all, there's well, lots of skittishness. See, mom defending her cubs from the smaller, from the, from the bigger cubs. So this is quite a confusing moment uh, in lion life. It's going to be such incredible vocalizations. Okay, I'm just going to move forward slightly. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, mom's about to go rip him on. I saw the one little one. There we go, growling at. She's calling her cub, but the other cubs are trying to play with it. We can't see it, but I can just hear what's going on. Of course, they possibly choose the thickest area to do the meet up. So all three of her cubs are around here. The rest of the other cubs are all over the place. I'm very excited by new cousins to play with. Bernie, if you, you come in behind me, there's a good view. Okay, so while things are calm, we know where these three are. There's some more cubs directly in the, the river system in front. There's more cubs directly in front of us. And then there's lioness over there. And another one up on top. Now this is always a stressful time for a, for a mother to introduce the cubs to the rest of the pride. Watch this, watch. Snarling at one of the bigger cubs that was coming close to the little ones. So she's just worried the bigger cubs are going to be a bit too boisterous with the little ones. I'm just going to go sneak a slight bit forward again. Oh, no, we can't. Okay, let me just move quickly. a lot of this for the next while. So I think the majority, oh here comes trouble, I think another cub is making their way towards us, another one of the older cubs. Now the majority of them are just in front in that little thicket there. Now that's where she was sleeping yesterday, that was the den site she had the three littlies in yesterday. She's got three little ones to worry about and keep an eye on. And look, oof, look at that cheeky. One of the babies is quite upset about not being allowed to go play. There's, a, there's another older cub approaching and she's growling at it. Isn't this absolutely incredible? We got to see almost certainly uh, the first introduction of the little lion cubs to their cousins. Now where are you off to mom? Now as mom goes to greet the other lionesses, there's a strong possibility that the little other little cubs, are they gonna follow her? They're gonna follow her. comes a cub onto the, the bigger cub onto the little cubs. Now we can't, from where we are at the moment, I can't unfortunately move too much, but the, the mom is greeting the other adult lionesses. And now she's coming back because the cub is getting a bit rough. Oh, now other mom is coming to get involved because her little one has just been given a hiding. This is where cubs get hurt. This is why it is quite a, 
a stressful thing. Okay, let's trust. Oh, there we go. There's the scolded cub running back towards mom. I don't think she hit it too hard. It's more the sound that's more scary. So there are the older cubs. And there's just an incredible amount of vocalization going on. So this is the first time all eight cubs have been together. the last of the three littlies. I'm just going to try to idle forward a tiny bit. Okay, so we've got the female with the youngest cubs in the thicket here we can barely make her out but in front of us is one of the, the mothers with five the other five cubs How's that for him? Bit better? Okay. So we just... So I'm sorry, I'm just trying to lie out of the way here. So I can see yeah, all five cubs there accounted for. There's four between her legs and one lying off behind her. Now well, who's going to be the bravest of the little Inkahumas or the older Inkahumas to try and go play with their cousins again? Now this type of behavior is probably going to continue for sometimes up to two or three days maybe even a bit longer but eventually it will become normal now the inquisitiveness of the little ones they look like they're trying to sneak towards the bigger cubs So James Richard is wondering, one has to wonder what influences uh, that today was the day that the cub should beat the pride. James, I think it's the age. Um, they've got to the age where they're going to start becoming more reliant on meat, and uh, which for the lioness means they need to be able to feed with the pride. And it takes a bit of pressure off her in terms of milk production. Okay, so we've got one lioness there with the three little ones. We've got a second lioness with the five cubs. And then a third lioness. Can you see any more? I can only see three. Yeah, that's number three. Or well, there are two there, I can't see. I think there's just one there.
It's not to say, actually, I remember I did see another lioness up on the other bank, so that's four. It's quite possible that the fifth is here somewhere as well. Um, just trying to think. So it's not the easiest area to work in. Uh, Just try it. Uh, Shamsung is wondering, will the mother of the older cubs get mad for the other mother giving discipline to hers? Uh, it's, yes, sometimes. Uh, sometimes they just stay out of it. Now these sort of little social hierarchies need to be sorted out uh, quite quickly for the pride to start behaving amicably again. That lioness is getting annoyed with her own children or the the older cubs. So, guys, we're gonna have to, we've got to make space. There are a lot of other people coming. And we have spent uh, the whole morning so far with these cubs and had the best sighting. So I'm going to have to move out of here and let someone else come in. I think the initial aggression, that initial amazing interaction is over. So I think they're going to slowly figure out the pride dynamics during the day. We'll definitely be back here on the Sunset Safari to figure out what's going on. I'll wait just one second before we do. Mom's coming back down again. She might go greet the lionesses. And this is where the little, the older cubs sometimes take the opportunity to make a beeline to the little ones. Bernie, just give me a minute or two and I'll make space for you in the good spot. So we're just going to see what happens now. So there's greeting going on between the adult lionesses behind that bush. Okay, but we're just going to see what happens. So the, the smallest cubs are just off, but there looks to be a bigger cub who's thinking about going towards them. It seems the one of the smallest cubs is a little bit more timid than the others and staying a bit further back. Her mom is even growling at the older cubs if they come close to her while she's with another adult lioness. So that, that is one, two, three, four, five. Okay, all older cubs accounted for. Mm, growl that, turn around, retreat. And then the sm two of the smallest cubs are right next to us there in the thicket. And then one's just a bit further away. Okay, we're going to have to make space. It doesn't look like anything's about to explode right now. So isn't this incredible? The first ever uh, interaction of all the Nkuma cubs together. What a special moment to be here live. And I'm so happy that Vim and I got to share it with all of you. I think uh, we're talking quietly because we're next to the lines, but we're actually vibrating in our seats. We're so excited. But while we try and maneuver out of here, let's go see how Commander Bond is faring.
Hello everybody, not much to report from this end. We've left Arethusa, we did the length of the airstrip, we saw some monkeys and some interestingly some pied crows. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you ha have them on your bird list. Um, a rather unpleasant bird that goes kah, kah, kah. It reminds one of death and destruction, so we didn't hang around there. It mustn't be around birds that remind you of death and destruction, must you, Brian? No. no. Very depressing. Tingana still remains very comfortably ensconced at One Eye Pan on Simbambili, so we haven't come near him, and we also haven't found any tracks of shadow. So we're back kind of at square one. So I think what we'll do is go towards Treehouse Dam and see if we can't find uh, if Karula has come down there. Incredible, incredible jealousy I feel right now for the experience you've had with those cubs. Uh, yes, difficult to not feel uh, extreme forms of green jealousy. Brian, do you agree? I do agree. Yes, Brian is also green as am I. But we did have our turn. We did have our turn with those cubs, yes. That's very, uh, that's very um, magnanimous of you, Brian. Yes, yes. So we've now left the environs of Arethusa and we'll go back on to Juma. <laughs> Hello Sandy in Missouri, you say you want to come on safari but you're worried because you don't want to see a buffalo being killed and you don't want to watch an animal suffer. Sandy, I've been out here for 15 years now, or plus minus thereabouts. I've probably seen mm, less, I've probably seen maybe 10 to 20 kills in all that time. Uh, maybe that from start to finish. It's so unusual, it's so rare that you would ever see that. So I really don't think it would be something that you have to worry about if you came out here. and. If it did occur while you were on game drive, well, you could just tell your guide you didn't want to watch it and they'd take you away. So there's no, I really don't think that that would be the very last thing I'd be worried about before I came on safari was the fact that I was might see a kill that would leave me feeling emotionally distraught. So no, absolutely, I do not think that watching safari is a better option for you than being out here. I promise you now, if you can manage to get out here, you will be amazed by the feeling, the sights and the sounds and the smells and all of those things that you just get a kind of virtual impression of on the safari drives, but that are magnified a hundredfold if you come here. There is a Steenbok there. Can you see him, Brian? And he is looking at us with great suspicion. Many Steenbok in this area. It's a little bit more open than some other areas. He's very dainty. I can't believe that an animal that size, I mean everyone, he probably weighs about 8 kilograms at absolute maximum. That is about 18 pounds. And you can't believe that it survives out here. <laughs> and he's looking, he's what we call a concentrate feeder. So he's looking for buds and shoots and uh, ideally green stuff, probably the odd subterranean bit of greenery because it's very difficult for them to find enough to eat. They've got an extremely high metabolism and so the kind of bulk dry grass that we saw the zebra and the buffalo eating, they are not able to do that. They must find green stuff and it's often why we find what these uh, little antelope, like the diker and the steenbok, they're so often what we call mixed feeders. So they eat both browse and graze. Now this is now the third time we've come past this particular area today. And that is not to say that it's a waste of time, because as we all know, things do pop out on the road in front of us. Sometimes. Go across to Treehouse Dam now. 
We've had some lovely hornbill sightings during the day while you were looking at the lions. I'll try and get you another one now. Ooh. <laughs> Hello, Crystal in Maine. You say you're planning a safari for your honeymoon or you're planning on coming to South Africa. Congratulations on your imminent nuptials. Um, <laughs> You say your husband wants to, or your husband-to-be wants to know whether you can camp out here on safari. Uh, Crystal, you can. You can, uh, I'm just looking at the road. I think these are hyenas, they're not dogs. Yes, definitely hyenas. Uh, you can camp. Uh, you can camp in the Kruger Park. You can camp in the Pilansberg. You can camp in just about all of our national parks, I think. So absolutely you can. Um, you can do that sort of camping, or you can do what they call glamping. And glamping... <laughs> glamping is a glamour camping, if you like, where you can go and you can stay in a very fancy tent uh, at one of these lodges. And, well, that's the, that's the kind of camping light way of doing it. So, Crystal, definitely. Any of our national parks and many, many different uh, private reserves where you can do this sort of glamping type of thing. I had some guests once who, um, it's the only time it's ever happened before that they, they were just filled with fear at everything they saw. They didn't want to get out of the vehicle when we had drink stops. They didn't want to have sundowners in the bush. They just wanted to be back in the lodge or very far away from all the animals. And they said afterwards, you know, halfway through the safari, they said, we don't really understand how people could come out here uh, willingly again, you know, because it's so terrifying. I, when I told them that people come and get married out here and uh, come on honeymoon, they were absolutely scandalized. But it is very, very common that people come on honeymoon in Africa and get married, especially out here in the bush. It's a great place to get married. Now there is a little mixed herd of impalas. And they really enjoy these sort of fire break areas, they, these areas that have been cleared on the fringes of the woodland. The other thing many people think of, of course, when they think of Africa, they just think vast, great, open savanna areas with herds of te wildebeest teeming across the plains. In southern Africa, much, many parts of Zambia, many parts of Botswana, Zimbabwe, they're like this. It's sort of um, open woodland with, you know, patches of clearings. Very pretty shining in the sun. Let's keep going. And Sarah, you want to know about the relationship between private reserves and government reserves or national parks. Why are we dragging a stick there? I'm just going to quickly reverse. Sarah, an area like this is a, a collection of private reserves. Is it out? Ah, we were dragging that stick with us. So an area like this is a collection of private reserves that is connected to the Greater Kruger National Park. So the Kruger Park, off to the east of us, there's no fence between us and them. And for many years there was a fence, and then in 1992, the, with an agreement between the park and the private landowners, uh, where basically there was various negotiations on how the land would be used and managed, uh, those fences came down. So it's quite nice for the park because it's a buffer between them and the sort of mass of humanity on the western fringes of the park um, and that relationship is a very strong one. I'm not sure that it happens too much in other parts of the country. I know where we were talking about Addo a little bit earlier. Addo, yes, there are sort of uh, private concessions on the fringes of the Addo National Park. Um, otherwise, private companies also get concessions within the national parks where they don't own the land but they lease it. So all sorts of complicated arrangements, Sarah. Uh, all of them very good for conservation because the government can't really afford to buy more, too much more land. And likewise, um, agriculture is, has often been proven to be the wrong land use for much of our, our landscapes. And so where you're next to, if you have farmland next to a national park, 
well you can join it up keep the land uh, but then use it appropriately and that expands land for conservation which is great yes. now those in parlor will be hoping I suspect to come down here and have some water but there is no water at treehouse dam at the moment it's just waiting for the great deluge is supposedly going to ensue and it actually smelt like rain this morning while you were looking at the lion cubs I'm not sure that you were paying much attention to the smell in the air and the smell in the air certainly indicated moisture but that I think will dissipate and that will happen continuously up until we get some proper rain these kind of uh, threatening fronts will come in right, we're nearly at the water hole let's have a quick look there not that there's any water there. I have got a real um, withdrawal systems. I've got real withdrawals for not seeing Hosanna and Shongile, the prince and princess. Uh, JB, I think it's JB as opposed to JZ. Was it JZ or JB? Quite something if JZ was watching us, wouldn't it? Um, oh, JD for duck. Right, JD, you say, do I ever go, just go out into the rain and stand there? Um, I, I, sometimes I do. I don't do it a great deal because I get cold. But <laughs> yeah, sometimes on a really hot day out here, uh, if it does sort of start thundering down, it is a great pleasure to go and stand out in the rain for a little while and soak in the African rain. It's a wonderful thing to do. But I tend then, like most creatures out here, to seek shelter <laughs> once I'm soaked to the bone. No, I don't see much going on here, do you, Brian? There don't seem to be a great swathe of leopards or birds. Now, in this tree on my right-hand side, everyone, we will hopefully have some weavers fairly soon. Now the weavers, we had a pathetic crop of weavers last year on account of the lack of rain and I'm hoping that when this water hole fills up the weavers will return with their swizzling gorgeous calls and lovely golden feathers. And those pods, the only reason they survive there is because nothing is tall enough to get at them. Let me just try and retrieve one. How hungry are you, Brian? Very hungry. Well, you're in luck. So, here are the pods, everybody. And they're obviously extremely nutritious, and many animals will try and eat them, and that's why they're only at the top there. And because of the tree being on the bank, it's not particularly easy to get at. Brian, here's a seed for you to chew. I wouldn't swallow it, just uh, give it a bit of a taste, I think. What mulpit are you giving me there? I might be mul. What's mulpitter? Um, mad pills. Mad pips. Mad pips. What do you think? I can't even get my teeth through it. Okay, that's no good. Would you like some pod? Should we try pod? Hmm. I always thought that they would taste a little bit like porridge. I don't know why I would have thought that. They don't, do they? Quite tasteless. Utterly tasteless, yes. Anyway, if I was a starving elephant, I might eat them. Mm. As I've said to you many times, you wouldn't survive out here if you couldn't hunt some kind of animal to eat. Not much in the way of decent vegetation to chew upon. Yuck. Right, on we go. Not one elephant have we seen today, everyone. There is a little bit of that acacia taste to it which you get out of the bark. Which isn't too bad. But it's not exactly delicious. It's not going to taste like the muffins that uh, Amanda is no doubt preparing as we speak. Alrighty, while I try and find some form of heartbeat out here, let's go across to Brent and find out uh, what further heartbeats he's found.
So the noise of that interaction with that Nkahuma lioness and the older cub got those two male lions that were in Torchwood up and mobile. So they lost them in these thick blocks around here. So we've just done a quick patrol and we're going to turn around to another patrol and to see if they pop out on our eastern boundary. So far there's no tracks, but we know male lions, oh, they can be a bit lazy. So they might crash down when they don't hear any more of that growling thinking, oh, it's not a free meal after all. But I think there's an incredibly good chance that by sunset safari we're going to have the males around as well. Okay, so no tracks so far. Just in other updates around, uh, there's two cheetah about two kilometers from us. Unfortunately, they are deep inside Buffalo's Hook. So I'm just listening to the radio. So what I'm going to do is that we're going to keep looking for these males for a little bit and I'm going to try if we get the opportunity to pop in to those lions and cubs again for a little bit. But what I'm really hoping is that we find the males and then able to follow them into that sighting. Wouldn't that just be too spectacular? Now, I think I'm being a little bit... What, what, what's the word we're looking for here? over positive but I don't know I know lions and those males would have heard that growling and they definitely would have become interested in what was going on so the last place they were seen was about a couple of hundred meters from here and they were heading in a southwesterly direction which is directly towards where the rest of the pride are Come on, putty cats. But now, that interaction we, we saw today is, is something that very, very few people who come on safari get to see. The only time you really see stuff like that is when you are out every day. So it is unbelievable that we were there when the right place at the right time to get to see some of the most spectacular lion interaction that we've witnessed on Safari Live. And while we keep searching for the Birmingham boys and hopefully they're on their way to join the rest of the pride, uh, let's go to James who has found a very large heartbeat. Now we've just had a fascinating interaction here everybody. These elephants were spread out all over this junction and I think they'd kind of wandered away from each other such that we managed, we, when we drove in here the babies were separated from the big cow you're looking at now and they got a fright and they all kind of stopped and they listened and they realized that if we wanted to we could have got in between them and she turned to face us and gave a kind of rumbling order and then they moved into the bush let's just move around the corner here I think there are quite a few down here Now, there are a few more in front there. These chaps were a little bit nervous of us for some reason. There they go, there. Hello, Tasha. A good question from you about elephants and where their movements, whether they come into this area uh, or if, if this is just the same herd of elephants we're seeing all the time. Tasha, uh, we would certainly do see some of the same elephants all the time. You had that half-trunk herd that we uh, so named today. You had them at Bivelshook Dam. We see them quite often. But they do roam very widely. So lots of the elephants we see here we've never seen before. Uh, lots of them will come on to this reserve for a little while and then they'll disappear. Look at the suckling there. Isn't that amazing? It's getting quite big for suckling, that one. will definitely be on the solids as well. So Tasha, many of the elephants here we won't have seen before and many of the ones that we do see regularly will disappear for sometimes months. They'll go into the Kruger, they'll go north into the Manuleti, perhaps to the Timbavati, south into the southern reaches of the Kruger and they will range very widely indeed. It's always seemed to me that that um, sort of arrangement there 
the way a an elephant has to has to suckle always looks to me like it's quite awkward. But it seems to be fairly effective. And so often, you know, the cow just won't stand still. She'll just keep moving and feeding and calf's just got to get what he can. This is fantastic. And look at the hips showing there on the elephant cow. She's not looking particularly good. Hello, voter in Bristol. Uh, with your name, I'm going to assume that you probably um, are from South Africa. So, welcome home. Uh, you say... Let me just give a bit of background before I give your question uh, out. So, until 1996 or so, every year, there was an elephant cull where they euthanized up to 900 elephants every year in an effort to maintain the population at about 7,500 in the Kruger Park. Uh, this was a complete thumbsuck number, and, I mean, it doesn't seem to have any scientific basis whatsoever. And voters' question is, since that culling, uh, the last one was in 1996, he says, because of it, is there some kind of skewed age distribution amongst the elephants because of the culling? Um, where we've got an increase in youngsters and greater numbers of uh, smaller number of older ones. Voter, the answer is no, because when they did do the culling, they took out whole family groups. So they didn't take out only one age, they took out elephants of all ages. So, I mean, this is going to, this is a nasty thing to have to, or scenario to have to paint for you. But what they would have done, for example, is come into an area like this, find these elephants, and they would have uh, basically taken out the whole herd. So that youngster that's suckling, they... <coughs> that's the little one shouting at its mum. <laughs> and all the adults, and so they would have taken out equal numbers. And so no, I don't think the population um, age distribution is skewed at all. Thankfully, that stopped in 1996. It's one of the reasons we we're able to approach these animals to the closeness that we are and that's recent that's a recent development in the next last five or six years maybe ten years but it took at least ten years for the elephants to really calm down that's the little one that's the little one trying to or just having a bit of a sulk so often we hear that and we think it must be the adults and then you see it happening and it's the young ones being cross in it. You see the little one there took, it's a young bull, and he wants that piece of branch that his mum was trying to eat. And Sally in Oregon, I don't know the answer to this, um, but through an intuition, you say, do the, will the elephants like that one we saw suckling there suckle longer because of the lack of food? I imagine if their mothers um, are lactating, then yes, they probably will. But remember, the lack of nutrition in the bush is going to mean that the elephants lactate slightly less. You know, in the same way that a human being mother has to eat uh, properly in order to produce sufficient milk. So it is with all the animals out here. It's quite sweet. A little baby playing with that stuff behind there. Getting very cross because mummy picked it, obviously ate off the bark, and then this little bull wanted to play with it, so he got cross and shouted. Now you see how he's not quite able to pick it up yet. <clears throat> had to push his, push his mouth down onto it. Isn't that amazing? Nevin in Australia, we're watching that little cow eating Acacia gerardii, which is the red thorn, and it's a specifically selected for plant. They definitely eat a lot of Acacia gerardii and during the dry season. And you say, 
do I think that elephants can identify plants to the extent that they would perhaps not eat specific plants during a drought in, in order to spare them, in order to save them and make sure that they, they, they had some for later almost. Uh, Nevin, I don't think it's impossible. I think certainly elephants have shown sufficient, um, to my mind, sufficient intelligence to be able to recognize different plants that we know they recognize different plants. They use them for uh, possibly medicinally. So is it too much of a stretch to think that they would therefore save plants uh, in a drought time? I'd say it probably is too much to say that, Nevin. I'm going to say I don't think that happens um, because they do have to survive and you know, we know that they do denude areas where if, if, if there isn't enough rain, they will denude areas of vegetation. Um, but I'm going to say it's not impossible. So I'm hedging my bets there. But I don't think it's impossible that these elephants would save plants during drought times. But I mean, you've seen how many knob thorns they kill uh, seemingly unnecessarily. I think they very much go around acting instinctually as far as that goes, in the same way that human beings do. You know, we act very instinctually when it comes to resource use. We don't, um, we don't react to resource use in a particularly conscious fashion. Even in the Western world, in fact, especially in the Western world, I'm just going to move forward, there's some others in front of us. And, you know, when you go home and you put the kettle on or put the toaster on or uh, put something in the oven, you're consuming a massive amount of energy without much consciousness for uh, what its effects are. And I think it's exactly the same with an elephant. It has to eat, it has to have something to eat, and so it doesn't think tremendously of the future. We like to think that we do, but in actual fact, we don't really. If we did, we'd have cold showers every day. And we wouldn't have toast. Now, Danny, you're wondering about whether or not these elephants have to be taught to use their trunks. They just come, a couple coming out here, two young bulls, I think. Uh, Danny, they don't have to be taught to use their trunks, but it does take them a while. It takes them about two years to fully master control of those funny trunks because they've got a huge number of nerve and muscle fibers in them that uh, takes the brain a long time to learn to control. I can hear one of them talking in the background there, quite possibly the big matriarch. Oh, she's going, well that's what it sounds like to our ears. I imagine those growls and um, grumbles that the elephants make sound completely different to an elephant's ears. Lovely when the light comes out. Hmm. Very nice question. We were talking about the cull earlier, everybody, and Voter was asking about the cull, which ended in 1996, and then Gary. No, sorry, Michael. Not Gary. I don't know where I got Gary from. My, Michael, you're 18, and you were wondering about the uh, you, a documentary you watched about Gorongosa National Park, which is in Mozambique, and you were wondering about the violence to which the elephants were subjected, met much poaching, and many elephants killed there, and you say, how is it that you go about habituating elephants again once they've experienced such trauma at the hands of human beings? by doing what we're doing right now, by sitting amongst them, spending time here, showing them that you are absolutely no threat to them whatsoever. They still perceive us as a threat, make no mistake. That's it's why we can't get that close. Sometimes we can, sometimes they ignore us completely. But you saw the way that little elephant there lifted its head and opened its ears out towards us. That's a sign, of course, that it is uh, not very comfortable. But the youngsters do that. Ah, Brent has uh, gone back to the lion cub, so let's go and have another look at them.
well, normality being restored. If you can describe what we saw this morning as abnormal, which it's not, it's quite normal. But everything is quite calm here now. Oh, there's one of the older cubs. Now, we're just going to take you around, show you where everything is. So the three littlies, there they are, having a schnooze together. And just to the left of them, between them and the rest of the cubs, there's mom. Also schnoozing. Oh, oh quickly come up. Oh, there we go. It's going to try to sneak around the back. That is not a good idea, little one. Ever heard of the saying, curiosity killed the cat? Oh, mom's growling, but she's not charging in just yet. Seems like she's decided they might be being gentle enough for now. Now, this sort of process is going to go on for the next couple of days as they all get used to each other. But any over boisterous behavior will result in a firm hiding from mom. Now, we had no sign of those males crossing, so maybe they're still on their way. Oh, well, let's just see what happens. So, if you have a look, just to the left of the little leaves through the thicket, oh, there we go, taking a step closer, step closer. Mom's not looking at the moment. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm not really going towards the little ones. I'm just actually just crawling around in the drainage line here. Very interesting to see what mom does if they actually get close enough to touch the tiny cubs. Now with those little older cubs, oh look at mom's tail, flickety flickety. Even though she's sleeping, she's on edge. All's calm for the moment. So we've confirmed all f Oh, yes, discretion, the better part of valor. Mom, one look, and the older cub went back across to the other side of the, of the river system. There is still one little of the larger cubs, still quite close. You can just see it through the bush behind. But it seems to be quite calm at the moment. So they're the little ones, plus one or two of the others. There's Mom. There's another one of the others. So all five lionesses are here. Now we can't really see too well, but through this thicket, there's actually two lionesses. Um, there's one there, and the other one's just below it. So very difficult to see. And there's one. Another one just to the right. I don't know if we're going to be able to see it from here. And then Amber, being cool as a cucumber. Oh, on that note, Amber picks her head up. Sorry, I just got to be on the game drive for a second. Station coming to the Ngala, I'm directly to your east. Sorry about my head getting in the way. So there we go, Amber Eyes lying a little bit away from the rest, probably because of all the pandemonium that's been going on earlier this morning. Hi, Michael. Michael, who's 18, is wondering at what age will the male cubs start to establish that tight bond that is going to be needed when they leave the pride? They've already started establishing those bonds, Michael, so that those bonds are already being established as we, as we sit here and observe them. And if they're in the same litter, those bonds are established from within hours of birth. So very, very peaceful. Thought we'd just come have one last little check-in and uh, before 
we make space for the other vehicles. It's quite a difficult area, so you can't put too many vehicles in here. Not because the lions are upset, just because the bush is so, so trying. Watch my head. There we go. Amber's just watching carefully. So we're going to leave the lines. We'll be back this afternoon. Hopefully the Birmingham boys are here. But I think all the action is over for the morning and it's going to be lots of slumber. Maybe they might move towards the Buffalzook waterhole, but we'll find out on the Sunset Safari. So while we make our way out of here, let's go back across to James. Finally, we're able to show you a hornbill, everybody. They're on the ground there in front of us. Do you see them, Brian? I'm not going to approach any closer. I think they've spotted us. They're eating in amongst the dung of some impala. And Brian, while we didn't notice, while we were looking at those ones, at the red-billed variety, one has snuck up towards us, a yellow-billed. Oh. Do you think he's seen us, Brian? I hope, I hope not. Now he's eating ants, I'm pretty sure. Maybe termites. Either way, the skill required to pick them up with that long protrusion in front of his nose, exceptional. If you're wondering about whether or not it is skillful, strap a banana to the front of your face and see how softly or accurately you're able to hit a target uh, on a wall in front of you. Have you ever tried that, Brian? I haven't. No. Um, that's because it's really very difficult. What's that? Stone. It's got, oh, it's a, it's a marula nut. Without any nuts in it. It's just the casing. You see, you just dropped it. I really don't think that their beaks would be strong enough to crush those nuts if there were actual nuts in them. Having a little relax now. You can hear the fairly strident call, I suppose, of the virtual starling. Not too far from here. And cap, cap. And then also, in fact, let's just stay with the hornbill for now. That tail is so amazing. They, of course, will now be thinking about the breeding season too. They'll be looking for suitable nesting holes. So one of the things that Scott was very good at was finding he was a presenter here, everybody, in case you're wondering who Scott was. Scott was a presenter, and he was excellent at finding nests. Unbelievable, in fact. Completely uncanny how he could do it. Now, that bird will basically have to do what it's doing now for the rest of the day. It will wander about here, finding ants and finding termites. If it's very lucky, it'll find the odd seed, the odd piece of fruit. It's a rather splendid bird, though. And then they rest in the night time. Much more so, completely unlike, um, completely unlike, say, a vulture, which will eat briefly and then can go days without eating anything. And that's because vulture obviously eats meat and it hangs in the air. It uses very little in energy at all. Very nice, Brian. Mm. Superb hornbill sighting. See what other birds there are in the clearings here. There were some doves, some ring-necked, or humble ring-necked doves. There they are. Sorry, straight in front here. There we are. Yeah. 
Now, Valley in Oregon, or Bally, is it Valley or Bally, Kirsten? Sally. Not Valley or Bally, Brian, but Sally, uh, which is a more common name than Valley or Bally, normally for people. Um, you say African birds are so colourful. Yes, some of them are, as we look at the <laughs> ring neck dove, which is inescapably uncolourful. But yes, I do. F the closer you get to the equator, the more colourful the birds become, Sally. And so you will find that where you live in Oregon and m everywhere on that latitude throughout the globe, you will find that you'll get the odd brightly coloured bird, but uh, nothing like the number that we get here. And we, in turn, will get nothing like the number you get, say, in the Amazonian rainforest. I mean, you get those quite astonishing plethora of colourful parrots there and macaws. The Australians also have got a number of very colourful birds, especially when you get into the North Country or the Northern Territories. So we're kind of in between, and we do have a number of very colourful birds. The ring-necked dove not being one of them. Right, oh, there's some zebra up ahead. Our cup has begun to fill up, Brian. The zebras are going to be having a drink at the water. Closer. Hmm. <laughs> Greg in Oklahoma. We've had lots of uh, lots of questions from the flatlands of the Middle America today. So thank you for getting hold of us, all of you. A collective thanks. Um, you say once these ponds, these dams fill up, will we restock them with fish? No, we won't. We don't touch them with fish. And it's interesting because one of the great mysteries. Well, if you're not a biologist or somebody familiar with these areas, is how on earth these places fill up with fish again. And the way they do it, Greg, is we think, well, well, there's certainly a lot of fish eggs, dormant fish eggs in the mud. So something like catfish will certainly have their eggs in the mud. And then, and on the vegetation, and I think what also happens is that big birds like, say, storks, which fly between water holes, I think they carry fish eggs on their legs and also in their dung, I've no doubt. So when they... <laughs> He's exhausted, Brian, isn't he? It's a tough morning. Um... <laughs> There's something very funny about a horse or a... <laughs> or a zebra, in this case, yawning. Um, in fact, it may... <sighs> Sorry about that, everybody. That was purely brought <laughs> brought on by the zebra. Phew. Right. Um, eggs, fish. Right, okay. Storks will carry the eggs, that's right, and their dung and on their feet. And I think you'll find, I mean, there are probably two or three species of fish that we get here. Catfish being one of them. And a couple of tilapia species. Well, those are the only two, really. And so we don't need to stock them. But it is astounding. If you build a new dam, they were never stocked. So if you, if you ever, um, if you were ever at a, uh, or if you were ever on a farmland and they they dug a dam and they you know it filled up with water, you would find within months there would be plenty of fish in it. And it was a great mystery as to how on earth they got there. Hello, I walk in the rain from Iowa. I don't think I've heard from you for a while, so thanks for getting hold of us again. You say, um, is the crew betting on whether when the first rains will be like we did last year? I don't think we have taken a, a bet, have we? Um, we've certainly taken a bet on the amount of rain. Jean-Dre is uh, backing the those who uh, believe in the deluge is going to ensue fairly soon. Um, I'm ambivalent. I'm 50-50. I can't decide whether I think it's going to be a wet season or not. Last year, of course, Brent and I said it's not going to rain before the end of October, and we had a big downpour in early September, and then not much else for the rest of the year.
What do you think, Brian? When do you think the first rains are going to come? I have no idea, actually. I haven't really thought about it. Brian, that. too, <laughs> has of no opinion. No, so I walk in the rain, no bets at this stage. Perhaps we should have a pool. I will say, I'll open it. I walk in the rain. I think it's going to be at, I'm going to say early October, 10th of October, first rains over 20 millimeters. Early September. And you say early September. Yeah. Okay. There we are. Two bets, everybody. Okay, we're going to say goodbye to you for the morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm really pleased you had the lions, mainly because we really didn't have much else to show you, so it was great that you had all the lions there. We'll probably pop back there this afternoon and see how they're doing. Until then, uh, thank you, Brian, and your rather disheveled thumb. I hope it has a baby. It'll have a bit of a sleep now, will it? Yeah, I think it will. Yes, good. Give it a bit of a sleep, yeah. and we'll see you later at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Bye-bye. What an absolutely spectacular morning. I mean, I, don't, I think we can use all the adjectives. Spectacular, amazing, wonderful, supreme, exquisite. And uh, the reason for that is we got to see some incredible behavior. And I know sometimes the visuals weren't that good because they were in the thicket, but just to be present for the new cubs joining the pride. And that is, a, I'm just on an absolute high at the moment. And uh, uh, VM and I are both so happy that you were able to join us for that little snippet into the secret life of lions. So, oh, great stuff. And I, uh, and I think I've got a strong suspicion that the Birmingham boys might be there by sunset safari. There's some cloud moving in. It's staying cool. So maybe those male lions will come join the rest of the pride. Now, the pride does look like they have eaten, but they could definitely eat again. So maybe they'll be on the hunt on the sunset safari. So exciting prospects ahead. And uh, isn't it wonderful that they using seem to be using Juma as their base. Now, oh, so much excitement. Now, I hear James is betting on rain. And he says the 20th of September, for the first rain over 20 mils. Oh, 10th of October, I was about to say, September, that's that's quite wish, I think that's big wishful thinking. Vim, what's your call? Also, October 1st. October 1st, Vim says. Only a little bit. Only a little bit. So we're talking about over 20 mils. I'm gonna be a bit more pessimistic. I think we're not gonna get over 20 mils till the 6th of November. That's my call. The 6th of November to get over 20 mils. Although weather patterns are quite strange at the moment, so one never knows. Now, just to keep you updated, the cheetah went south into Torchwood and we're heading steadily south. Uh, towards the Torchwood and Coral boundary. So there's a strong possibility, possibly on the Sunset Safari, that those cheetah are going to pop up on the northern edge of Cheetah Plains. So fingers crossed there. And uh, then just for our, our leopard lovers, I uh, just got a report as we're driving back now that Shaluva 2005 has been found just to the north of our Traverse area and she's got an adult impala kill which she's hoisted. So she's in the area. So hopefully she'll decide to move south at some point. That is one of the leopards I haven't seen. But just let's go on again about how incredible the lions were this morning. We got to see the most unbelievable interaction. Uh, the first introduction of the Nkahuma cubs. Uh, the latest Nkahuma cubs to the rest of the pride. And I can't wait to get out in a few short hours. And the sunset safari. See if the Birmingham's arrive. See if there's any more really interesting interaction between those lions and it is going to be very interesting for the next few days but don't forget join us in a few short hours to see what happens next with the incredible Inca Humas. So from VM and myself, goodbye. <laughs>